younger than Damon Blackfire, older than Bloodraven. Bittersteel was also a warrior and looked the part. He was only half Targaryen, so he got the purple eyes, but his hair was black. As an adult, he wore a beard, cropped very short, little more than a shadow on his face and jaws. Somewhat of a Conan-esque look to him, but not the Frank Frazetta Conan and definitely not the Arnold Conan, more the Barry Windsor Smith version or the one described by Robert E. Howard. He is tall and well-made, but lean and lithe as a panther, and angry, no smiles here. Bittersteel was pissed off all his life and had a special loathing for Blood Raven and his mother, who had displaced his own mother as the king's favorite. Thanks to No Diggity for the art. Check him out at mike-halstein.deviantart.com for other great pieces. In the first four parts of our series on the Blackfire Rebellions, we laid out the conditions and personalities that led to the Great Civil War. It was really quite fun. Then we discussed the war itself, and that was fun as well. Now, as you all know, Damon Blackfire died on the Redgrass Field, his army was defeated, and that ended the war. But not the Blackfire cause. Right, this was the first Blackfire Rebellion, and there were four more attempts by Blackfire descendants to seize the Iron Throne. The reason for this, the reason the Blackfire stayed organized and capable, the reason they were still to be feared, is Bittersteel. The reason the Blackfires threatened their Targaryen cousins for 50 more years after the Second Rebellion is Bittersteel. His ability and determination made it all happen. It was he who reclaimed Blackfire itself on the battlefield. It was he who gathered Damon's other sons, daughter, and widow, and fled with them across the narrow sea before King Daron's loyalists could capture them. Now, apart from looming large in the history of Westeros, Bittersteel is also a compelling character. The sources, including Martin himself, say that he was motivated by hatred, anger, and jealousy. He drew strength from this, and he was a gifted warrior, leader, and plotter. Now, I think he sounds a little bit like a Sith. Yeah, Darth Bittersteel. <laughs> <laughs> like so many of GRRM's historical figures, he has enormous presence despite never appearing live on any page of the canon material. He's a perfect example of George R. R. Martin's ability to present compelling and dynamic characters indirectly. Yeah, Bittersteel is an enormously popular character, in part because we know him so well while simultaneously knowing so very little. The mystery really only makes us want more. Also in part because he's just plain awesome. <laughs> what we do know is pretty substantial, and it rules. So of course we want more. But let's not talk about what we don't have. Let's get on to talking about what we do have, because it's quite a bit. Right on. It is good to be back. Welcome back to another episode of History of Westeros podcast. We're back in black fire. <laughs> it's our fifth installment here in August 2016, but the first since October 2015. <laughs> Bittersteel is one of my favorites of all time. I'm almost always enthusiastic when talking A Song of Ice and Fire, as you know. But you might detect that I've taken it up a notch because of my love for this particular <laughs> subject. Uh, there's a few small challenges in how to frame this episode, but I don't want to bother you with those details too much, just to say, suffice, that it worked out really well. Uh, though we aren't covering Bittersteel's whole life in one episode. Uh, part of our enthusiasm for him and the fact that there's just so much to talk about means that we couldn't fit it all in one episode. So there will be more of him in the next one alongside other topics relevant to the Blackfire Rebellions. But the focus will be the Golden Company. iTunes listeners know that we've done a Golden Company episode before, mm -hmm. but it was so long ago that we didn't make a video for it because back then we didn't make videos. <laughs> yeah. We made it before the World of Ice and Fire, which means that it has been in some dire need of updating for a long time. Yeah. The final episode in our series will be on Blood Raven, and it will follow that Golden Company That's episode. right. So we'll have a nice, nice, uh, nifty seven episodes total for the Blackfire Rebellions, assuming we don't make any changes, which does happen. But I think we've got this one pretty set now. We've got a few helpers to thank. Of course, we have Rhaenys, uh, Rhaenys Targaryen, a frequent contributor and fact checker and an even bigger contributor than usual this time. She got us a uh, a lot of good thoughts and a couple of corrections on dates as well as a couple other things. Also help from Stephen Atwell of Race from the Iron Throne. Or race from. Race for the Iron Throne. <laughs> I would be racing from it. <laughs> and Stephen is going to be guesting on the Golden Company episode. He'll be back for his third, fourth appearance in our series. Also thanks to our Patreon dragon rider, Lord Mark of House Joseph, the Snow in Winterfell, and rider of Masla Cartho, a green and white dragon. As you can see here, the hatchling drawing by Ed Shear. Excellent stuff. We'll be following Masla Cartho's growth throughout various stages. Also thanks to Jeff Gnarly, the Long Snapper, History of Westeros' first sword. You can check out uh, patreon.com slash historyofwesteros for uh, 
other titles and your chance to get your cool nickname said aloud on our show. Having something to prove is one of the biggest human motivators of all time. Nations have fallen because of a chip on the wrong shoulder. There are dark and dangerous sides to possessing a drive fueled by such. Some confuse privilege with entitlement. Jealousy for injustice, anger for righteousness. Left unchecked and given time, emotions like these progress in intensity and become habitual, even addictive. Indeed, people like that are often so characterized by these traits that it becomes an inseparable part of their identity to both readers and characters throughout the history of Westeros. We all have people like this in our lives. It's not just a fantasy concept. People who just seem determined to stay angry, like they aren't comfortable unless there's conflict. Drama can be a distraction from having to live in one's own conflicted, frustrating mind. There are people like this pretty much everywhere. We don't all know people who have the double boon of high birth and hitting the genetic lottery, but we've seen them on TV and in movies. That's a really familiar concept. Yeah, take all those things and consider the two common sides of child re rearing. Nature versus nurture. On the nature side, take high birth, physical gifts, aggressiveness, and other traits important in the martial setting of Westeros. And then you mix them with an extremely ambitious, cutthroat family on the mother's side, and arguably the worst Targaryen king ever for your fatherly influence, and you've got Aegor Rivers. Martin straight up says that he was angry his whole life, and he writes his childhood in a way that explains why. So let's do like Quaith says. To go forward, we'll have to go back. Back to the start. Part 1. Early life, 172 to 184. Well, we're going back to Aegor's start, anyway. Back when he was a little bitter baby. <laughs> like Damon Blackfire himself, Bittersteel was the product of a union between Aegon IV and a girl who had been stashed in the Maiden Vault. That's right. Aegor's mother, Barbara Bracken, lived with Dana the Defiant and her sisters. Unlike Dana, however, who became pregnant with Damon Blackfire while living in the Maiden Vault, she escaped is why we mentioned that. Agor was conceived after Barbara was released from her captivity. Very shortly after. Barbara was said to be about 16. Yeah. Aegon would later name her one of his nine great loves, which is a group that does not contain Dana the Defiant, mm -hmm. notably. Now, Agor was born in 172. This was a fortnight before Daenerys Targaryen, as in the one who married the Prince of Dorne, who had the water gardens built for her, not the mother of dragons, obviously. <laughs> she came a bit later, yeah. <laughs> Damon Blackfire's birth was so scandalous that Baylor the Blessed starved himself to death. Similarly, Aegor's birth enabled his scummy father to threaten his own son Daron's place as heir. Yeah, I mean, think about these children. Won't someone please think of the children? <laughs> yes. So all of these kids had a huge impact just by existing, not by doing anything at all. Yeah, just by <laughs> being there. They became hugely important politically before they could even talk, let alone have a shred of agency. Not long after his own birth, baby Bittersteel's prospects would have appeared to be somewhat grand. This despite his bastard birth and the fates of Aegon the Unworthy's prior natural children. None of his illegitimate children prior to Aegor have been noted as significant. We don't know hardly anything about them. Though surely they were at least a minor embarrassment. Aegor's grandfather, Viserys II, dealt with his lustful son's bastards as best as he could, sending the many girls into the faith to be trained as septas. Yeah, though Aegon was rumored to have had a boy with the Bravosi courtesan, the Black Pearl, this boy is not otherwise spoken of, and it's very likely that he'd never set foot in Westeros at all. And we can even say that Aegor was the first bastard child of King, a King Aegon IV, while the other bastards were the children of Prince Aegon. Uh-huh. Different timing. It's important to note that. Thus, Aegor would not have been subject to the whisking away treatment delivered by Viserys II. Because, well, Viserys II was dead. <laughs> <laughs> and Aegon was the opposite of his father in many ways. Yeah, such as not giving a damn about propriety. The way that he saw it, Aegor was nothing to be ashamed of, especially considering that Aegon the Unworthy really didn't feel shame about anything in general. Here it would be quite the opposite, I guess. It seems likely that Aegon IV was proud of his very healthy, purple-eyed son. His mm. looks were unusual. It's rare to see someone with partial Targaryen features. In fact, there's very few examples of that. And it doesn't seem that his mother had black hair, though we're not 100% sure. And his father certainly didn't have black hair, but Aegor did. So that's, that's unusual. Yeah, well, starting off life as the son of a king, when that king is proud of you, 
That's a way to get a leg up for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, before he was old enough to understand anything at all, Agor had seemingly great prospects that included a shot at the throne itself. That might be surprising to some of you guys, especially, I, I mean, I know what you're thinking, Aziz, Shea, how could Agor have had a shot at the Iron Throne? Damon Blackfire was born before Bittersteel. And now that is absolutely correct, but Damon was not acknowledged by Aegon upon his birth. In fact, he wasn't acknowledged until he was about 12 in 182. So officially, for nine to ten years, Agor Rivers was believed by all but a few to be the eldest of King Aegon's bastard sons. Aegor himself may have believed this too, or at least his parents, and it may have fueled his ambitions or the resentments later. Aegor's mother and grandfather definitely took note of this. Bracken ambitions. Mm -hmm. Now, at the time of Aegor's birth, King Aegon was quite infatuated with Aegor's mother, Barba of House Bracken. Having the king's interest is an obvious opportunity for ambitious types, and the king went so far as to name Barba's lord father his hand of the king. As we said back in the Aegon episode, this was a pattern for Aegon. If you bring me a woman that I make my mistress, you can be my hand of the king. Mm. Though this was the first of those uh, yeah. trades. <laughs> now, surely this was the height of House Bracken's influence at court, and maybe just in general. You'd probably have to go back to truly ancient, ancient times when they were kings in the Riverlands to get close to this level of prominence. But as is often the case with the ultra-ambitious, this was not enough for Lord Bracken. Yeah. A slight digression is needed here. Though Westeros and Essos are largely towards the extreme ends on the patriarchy scale, surprise of nobody here, <laughs> mothers very frequently do name their children. And it's not just a Westerosi thing either. Khal Drogo, the barbarian warlord we all know so well, completely deferred to Daenerys on the issue of their son's name. Aegon IV doesn't appear to have had much to do with the naming of most or any of his bastards as far as we can tell. This could be an exception, but if not, what to make of the choice of Aegor as a name? I think it's actually very interesting. Mm -hmm. Daemon was named by his Targaryen mother, but none of King Aegon's other bastards had Targaryen names. Yeah, I think the name is very telling. Though Barbara may have asked the king's permission, it would have been a very cunning play for her to do so, to mm. ask that. Uh, it's the first time that we've seen this particular name. If there are any historical Targaryens named Aegor, Martin hasn't made it known. Like Daemon is Aemon with a D, Aegor is Magor without the M. An ominous choice, I think. Yeah, and Barba chose to emphasize this side of his heritage and not his Riverlander heritage, as opposed to, say, I don't know, Brendan Rivers, perhaps? <laughs> <laughs> There's a little dichotomy of choices there. If Aegon did actually choose the name Aegor himself, not Barba, then he may have deliberately chosen a Targaryen name to provoke his son. Yeah, very possible. Now, a fortnight after Aegor's birth, Queen Nerys gave birth to twins, a boy and a girl, but there was a little joy in this. Though baby Daenerys was healthy, and as we mentioned, she plays a major role in the saga, her brother was still born, and her mother, the queen, was bedridden for what turned out to be a pretty considerable length of time, and she really seemed likely to die. Now, as sad as that is, it was also Lord Bracken's opportunity to climb even higher, as he saw it. He started openly speaking of the king marrying his daughter Barba, <laughs> making her the new queen, if Queen Nera should perish, of course. Surely Barba pushed the king for this herself, though perhaps more subtly. <laughs> Regardless, her later actions paint her as an ambitious woman, so it seems very likely, almost a slam dunk automatic kind of thing. <laughs> she may have also emphasized symbolism of Aegor's birth year con coinciding with the year Aegon took the throne as well as the timing of Queen Nerys' apparent incoming death. Yeah, now consider the domino effect here, or what it would have been had Queen Nerys actually died. Baby Aegor would have likely been legitimized immediately instead of on the king's deathbed 12 years later. After all, in this scenario, Aegor's mother would be the true queen instead of a mistress. Surely she and her lord father, the Hand of the King, would have pushed for the child of their prior union to be legitimized. That seems and, pretty straightforward. Yeah, and that would have placed him in the line of succession, but still pretty far down. Still behind Daron, Baylor, etc., but still a prince. That's a pretty giant leap from royal bastard. He mm. would have been Prince Aegor Targaryen instead of Aegor Rivers. No doubt the Brackens were thinking beyond this. Once they have their kid in the line of succession, they can work to move him up. 
Being that far from the throne may seem like a difficult obstacle to overcome because you can't exactly murder a bunch of Targaryen princes, but this is King Aegon the Unworthy we're talking about. The man who legitimized Aegor and his fellow great bastards. The one with no shame, sense of propriety, or tradition. The idea that he would set aside his heir for another is completely believable from him. From another Targaryen king? Probably not. But from him, absolutely. Yeah, and this is all the more likely when you consider how much a King Aegon disliked Dorne, and how he seemed to be disappointed in his own firstborn son and heir, Prince Daron. Now, you need to remember that King Aegon himself had no say in his son's marriage to Dorne. It happened when he himself was a prince. So the Brackens could have reminded the king of this as often as possible, telling them, telling him that a king has the right to decide who his heirs are, and that he had that choice taken away from him by a man who wasn't even his father. And they make it, a decent point. Yeah, it is a pretty strong argument. And he's not exactly like a really centered guy. Like he was a guy that could be moved and convinced of things. They could point out that it was King Baylor who made the call, the man who arranged that marriage. It might help their argument that Baylor was, well, a crazy person. <laughs> yeah. Point out that a crazy person chose your family's destiny and, well, that just might be persuasive enough. Mm -hmm. Whatever tactics they used, Lord Bracken and his daughter's ambitions were a scandal to much of the royal court, including notables like Prince Aemon the Dragon Knight, who was probably Lord Commander of the Kingsguard by then, Prince Daron himself, the heir, and Shirley Mariah Martell, who was the prince's wife and herself the rightful successor to Queen Nerys. Yeah, she wouldn't be happy about any of this either. <laughs> when Queen Nerys recovered... It went well beyond scandal. Lord Bracken's plans completely backfired, and he lost his chance for more as well as all that he had gained to that point. The influence of Princes Daron and Aemon were sufficient, along with the scandal itself, to end the tenure of the Brackens at court. Agor's grandfather was removed as Hand of the King, and he and Barba were banished. Baby Agor, the unwitting, less than a year old, would-be usurper, went with, of course, to Stonehenge in the Riverlands. Yeah. Now, Aegor would have been too young to know or understand at the time, but someday he would no doubt realize that instead of a place somewhat high in the line of succession, if not the throne itself, he got the shaft. House Bracken, kings themselves many long, long years ago, would have brooded on this dismissal and loss of influence, this chance to regain their former glory and then some. And perhaps some of that rubbed off on young Agor, as it usually does with children, quite an impressionable species of human. <laughs> Later as well, he would pick up his family's predilection towards scheming, and this fits very well. He spent much of his career plotting, and he was exposed to his this type of thinking from the get-go. So it's no wonder he was so good at it. It reflects the environment he was born into. Yeah, Agor would eventually return to King's Landing, but not for quite a while. Not until his early teens. Instead, his earliest years were spent at a castle held by House Bracken for longer than recorded memory can deduce. His Bracken heritage would be front and center. During that interim, his mother and his Lord Grandfather schemed at new ways to get back to court. Now, Agor, as a son of the king, was a pretty clear and obvious tool for them to use in this regard, at least for a time. These might be some of his earliest memories. Meanwhile, events at court gave the Brackens reason to hope and reasons to loathe. A threat to disown. At some point, perhaps a few months, perhaps a year after the Brackens were sent away from court, the king started talk of invading Dorne, his own heir's wife's country. His own grandson Baylor, later Baylor Breakspear, had been born by then and was thus heir after Prince Daron and half Dornish. None of this seemed to matter to King Aegon, though. <laughs> what, what a guy. <laughs> but Prince Daron, Queen Nerys, Prince Aemon the Dragon Knight, and others pressured the king to abandon these plans. The king responded by trying to undermine his wife's fidelity <laughs> and thus threatened to set Daron aside in favor of one of his bastards. After Damon Waters became Damon Blackfire, it was he who Aegon threatened to name his heir. But again, at this point, which is the early to mid-170s, Damon's paternity was still unrevealed to the world at large. This reveal, again, didn't happen until 182, which means that Aegor was the one that the king was threatening to name his heir. Yeah, and those ambitious Brackens surely must have heard about this and probably started salivating. <laughs> yeah, picture it. They were kicked from court for pushing their claim to the throne, and here comes the king threatening to give them exactly that because he wants to attack his grandson's country. 
Forget sneaking into the line of succession down near the bottom and working your way up. The king was openly talking about making all that happen in a stroke. Yeah, without them having done anything. <laughs> it's amazing. And to think, if war with Dorne were a reality, it might cause a permanent rift between the king and Prince Daron's side of the family, further widening the opportunity to push their claim through Aegor. They may have been extra hopeful given that it wasn't truly the king's decision to send them from court. It was the prince and his people who talked the king into it. But there may not have been much they could do but wait and hope. The unworthy king would either follow through on his threats, or he wouldn't. Then again, it's likely that Lord Bracken, the former Hand, still had men that he could influence at court from afar, who could, in turn, encourage this war with Dorne. So he may not have been totally on the sidelines after all. That's a good point. Aegon's court was awfully corrupt, don't forget. He surrounded himself with flatterers and, and greedy people. <laughs> mm -hmm. Either way, King Aegon did eventually try to invade Dorne. But Storms took out his ships, and his siege train containing the seven wildfire shooting dragons was destroyed en route. It was so inept that one wonders if some encouraged the king to do it despite knowing it would likely fail. I mean, really? You're going to take dragon wildfire shooting machines through the Dornish mountains? I mean, that's just nuts. But we can get conspiratorial here. Perhaps the point would not be to win. Some people wouldn't care if the invasion failed or not. The point was just to <laughs> drive a wedge between the king and his heir and his Dornish family. By spilling blood on both sides, the hate could become permanent. Aegon's war effort could become a failure as long as they did some damage. That's all that mattered. Yeah, this would be an opportunity for some. By some, we mean the Brackens, of course, <laughs> and any other allies who would stand to benefit from their attempted return to power. Whether the Brackens influenced the decision to attack Dorne or not, it is safe to say that they wanted it to happen. It's also safe to say they didn't get the result they wanted. Far from doing some damage, <laughs> the grand total was none. No Dornishmen were killed. <laughs> the attempt alone was not nearly sufficient enough to drive King and Prince Daron together ap apart either. Thus, another opportunity for the Brackens turned into an epic fail. This one, not their fault, may have seemed another injustice of sorts. That they got so close again it would be hard to bear. But then another development at court would have probably bothered the Brackens a lot more. Just a lot, mm -hmm. lot more. <laughs> it's Bracken versus Blackwood, part 8,000. <laughs> Much is rightfully made of Bitter Steel's Targaryen blood, but he was also a Bracken. Thus, he was imbued with their famous and internal prejudice and hatred for House Blackwood. There were long periods of peace between these two rivals, but inevitably things would flare up again. So the hate waxes and wanes. The enmity for Raven Tree Hall would likely be at a particularly high point. Though their feud goes back to the Age of Heroes, a mere 40-some years ago during the Dance of Dragons, the Blackwoods, alongside Prince Daemon Targaryen and his dragon Caraxes <laughs> the Bloodworm, took Stonehenge after defeating a Bracken army at the Battle of the Burning Mill. But more importantly, not long after Barba was set aside and sent away, Aegon fell in love with Melissa, or Missy, Blackwood. News that the king had chosen Missy Blackwood and brought her to court would have caused great anger at Stonehenge. We're not told this, but it seems pretty straightforward, and we are told by Martin, straight up, that Bittersteel hated Missy. The, ambition, the ambitious Brackens, kings of old supplanted by the house they would least like to see rise this high, yeah, I'd say that they're going to be pretty pissed. <laughs> and it got worse. Yeah, Barba was heard to say that Melissa was as flat as a boy, where Barba herself was buxom. The king had previously named a hill between Blackwood and Bracken lands Barba's Teats <laughs> because of the way they're shaped. <laughs> when the king heard of Barba's insult to Melissa, he stripped the Brackens of Barba's Teats and gave them to the Blackwoods, renaming them Missy's Teats. <laughs> To this day, the Brackens call them Barba's Teats and the Blackwoods call them Missies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so choosing a Blackwood mistress immediately after a Bracken is pretty amazing. You just have to give credit to Aegon for his ability to create scandal. He's a true artist of relational strife, this unworthy king. <laughs> he really deserved that name. <laughs> but topping off their embarrassment, not that they didn't deserve it, with further embarrassment, giving some of your land to your most hated enemy... That is on another level. Yeah. From the Bracken point of view, this is rage-inducing, vengeance-swearing type of stuff. And this was all going down when Aegor was just becoming old enough to understand and to remember. In other words, these will be some of his earliest memories. Yeah. 
So Melissa stuck around court for five more years, which is a lot longer than Barbara did. And Brendan Rivers, also known as Blood Raven, was born during that time in 175. During that time, we guess that Barbara and her father blamed all sorts of ills on Blackwood influence. Agor would have heard a lot of this, too. Yeah. Now, I'm really kind of awed by George R. R. Martin's thirdness here. This is top-notch drama here, and it isn't even in A Song of Ice and Prior proper, as in the main five books, where we do not hear of these characters. But not this kind of detail. Yeah, right. It mostly comes from the World of Ice and Fire and the Duncan Egg books, especially the second, The Sworn Sword. If you are listening to this without having read any of those, you need to go get that done. Yeah. Uh, go to our website, click the links for the free Audible trial, and listen to Harry Lloyd, the actor who played Viserys, read Duncan Egg to you. He's really good at it. <laughs> or you can follow the links to order Night of the Seven Kingdoms through Amazon in Kindle or hard copy format and read it yourself. <laughs> With each page you turn, you'll be a bigger winner. It's really mm -hmm. good stuff. Love thy father? <laughs> now, children are very impressionable, as many of you know firsthand. <laughs> and, that, and no doubt, Agor would have been taught to hate the Blackwoods no matter what. But the Melissa Blackwood situation probably escalated this hatred to rarely seen heights. It said Agor's loathing for his half-brother Brynden Rivers in part began over their competition for Shiera Sea Star, but frankly, they never had much of a chance to be friends. After all, Brynden was Melissa Blackwood's son. Agor must have hated him before they even met, I bet. Yeah, I mean, Blackwood? Check. Yeah. Son of the woman who took his mother's place at the king's side? Check. That's enough. <laughs> To be fair, Melissa is said to have won over many at court, including Nerys herself. I mean, if you're a mistress to the king and can befriend the queen? Well, you got charisma. <laughs> <laughs> so, there's a small chance that Melissa could have won over Aegor, possibly. It's possible. But she never had the chance. Stonehenge is a bit far from King's Landing, and it's, they may have never met in person, very likely. But Stonehenge is not so far that the king couldn't visit, which he did. We're guessing that Barba and her father, the former Hand, actively encouraged the king to come see his son, Aegor. It's really hard to find positive things to say about Aegon the Unworthy, but one of these few is that he didn't shun his bastards or treat them as second class. Yeah. Now, when we analyze a character, we really try to put ourselves in their place and imagine things from their perspective. It's something George loves to do. It's just one of the essences of A Song of Ice and Fire and the fandom in general. Thinking along these lines can be really revealing. But sometimes something that should be obvious is is kind of hazy. In this case, we don't really know what Agor, nor Damon, Brynden, or Shiera thought of their father. Most Westerosi lords raised their firstborn son on high and looked down on their bastards. Aegon did the opposite, going so far as to threaten to raise Agor above Daron. It's for this reason that I believe Agor and probably the other great bastards, probably loved their father, despite how awful he was. At the start, anyway. Over time... <sighs> That might yeah. have changed. <laughs> sure, I mean, it is really irresponsible for a king to father bastards, but then again, they are those bastards. <laughs> Jon Snow suffered from some self-loathing in this regard, but not everyone is going to be just like him. Right, yeah. Some people can be proud, you know, even though they are bastards. Likewise, Aegon was cruel and unjust, but not to them. The great bastards were treated well, given gifts and honors, etc. And never forget that Aegon the Unworthy was very charming. You know, it's easy to forget that he was actually kind of, for a while at least, he's probably a fun guy to be around until he just became so terrible. <laughs> but in Aegor's case, it wasn't all good. I mean, again, this is Aegon the Unworthy we're talking about. Again, we don't know how he felt, but over time, there were reasons for his feelings to become mixed or even negative. He wasn't able to see his father and was probably told by his mother and grandfather that this was the fault of Daron, Nerys, Aemon, and those who had them kicked out of court. They would not blame Aegon himself, I think, at least not at first. So Aegor would probably have the common desire that children have, to know both of their parents. In this case, his father is the king, so that's a huge deal to a young boy, right? So the visit may have meant a lot to young Agor, who would have been about five at the time. Yeah, but his family had an, had an ulterior motive. Agor was perhaps the lure, but his young aunt was the bait. Mm. Bracken back at court. That's awful. Bracken <laughs> back. <laughs> Very good. From the Targaryen kings, the world of ice and fire.
Bethany was groomed by her father and sister expressly to win the king's favor and displace Missy Blackwood. In 177, she caught Aegon's eye as he visited at Stonehenge to see his bastard son, Aegor. By now, the king was fat and foul-tempered, but Bethany delighted him, and he took her back with him to King's Landing. Bethany and Barba's lord father, the former hand, went with. Aegor and Barba did not. And Melissa... Well, we don't actually know what became of her, but either way, Melissa was gone, and the Brackens got one over on the Blackwoods again. So what did five-year-old Agor think of his Aunt Bethany, of his grandfather? If he liked them, he wouldn't have liked what happened next. It may have changed his opinion on his father, eh, or perhaps this too was blamed on others. Bethany was executed after an affair with Sir Terence Toyne of the Kingsguard, as was Sir Terence himself and Barbara and Bethany's father, Lord Bracken, Agor's grandfather. Yeah, House Toyne famously attempted to avenge their brother by trying to kill Aegon the Unworthy, they instead killed Prince Aemon the Dragon Knight, and the Toyne family was stripped of their lands and titles, with the survivors fleeing to Essos and later turning up in places like the Kingswood Brotherhood. Much later, a Toyne, Miles Blackheart, will command Aegor's Golden Company. Now remember that point for later. It's probably not a coincidence that a house, exiled to Essos, with a, with a grudge versus the Targaryens, hooked up with Aegor, someone exiled to Essos with a grudge against the Targaryens. <laughs> but this was around 178 or so. So the Toynes will have to hang out in Essos for quite a while before Bittersteel comes along. <sighs> like Bitter Mother, like Bitter Son. <clears throat> in 178, six-year-old Aegor has just lost his grandfather and young aunt all of a sudden, and his family is back in disgrace so quickly after having their fortunes restored. Barbara would probably no longer have hopes of ambition ever again. And who knows what the new Lord Bracken would have even thought of all their prior machinations. It may have been an embarrassment to the other Brackens, though they did fight for Damon, so there's that. Yeah. Now, Lady Barba was so close to having it all, but it fell apart. Her chance was gone forever, and her sister and father were dead. Barba probably now hated her son's father. At a young age, by 172, she was the king's lover and a heartbeat away from being queen. By 178, all of those hopes were dashed and gone forever. Yeah, the shame and scandal probably meant that she would be forced to marry someone far below her station or remain unmarried for all her days. Despite all that had happened, she was only 22 or so by this time, and she had no future to speak of anymore after such promise just a few years before. It's easy to guess that she was angry and full of hate, all amplified by the sense of loss that comes with the death of close family. It's possible, probable actually, especially given such time passing, that young Agor picked up on his mother's feelings. I mean, it's what children do. Mm -hmm. Barba passed to young Agor this bitterness. Yep. And time wouldn't make things look any rosier for Barba. Four years later, King Aegon gave Blackfire to 12-year-old Damon Waters, knighted him, and revealed to the world that he was his son. Now, Barba may have already known this. I mean, mm. it's possible that she was friends with Dana the Defiant, who was Damon's mother. After all, the two lived together in the Maidenval, and it seems likely that at least Barba was influenced by Dana, who was 10 years older. Yeah, she probably looked up to her. Either way, Barba and Aegor both were being surpassed even more than they had been before, being pushed farther away from the center of power. Others of seemingly similar station were getting greater honors and preferential treatment. The great ancestral sword of House Targaryen is given to Daemon after winning a squire's tourney, and he's knighted, and all the realm hears how proud he is of his son. Daemon gets all that. Is Aegor even a squire by this point? No, I'd guess that he was. Maybe to the new Lord Bracken, perhaps. But he probably wasn't allowed in that squire's tourney, not even given a chance. So, of course, young Aegor may have had plenty of his own reasons to be bitter, his mother's influence aside. By this time, 182, he'd be about 11 and old enough to understand how close he had been to the throne and that he was still King Aegon's oldest male bastard. That is, until Damon Waters took his place. Like his mother, he learned that sting at a rather early age. Mm -hmm. Now, we were reminded of a story told by Martin at Balticon. His mother came from a formerly rich family, the Bradys, that had a long pier named after them and a fancy house. George would walk by these things and say to himself, Why don't we have that house? That dock used to be ours. I felt like an exiled member of a royal family. Maybe that's where some of the Danny stuff came from. Definitely shades of bitter steel here, too. That should have been my sword. <laughs> and I doubt they'd be comforted by the fact that, hey, at least this time it's a black fire, not black wood. <laughs> mm. 
the Brackens were even getting a little FaceTime, let alone dynastic swords. <laughs> yeah, right, it's safe to say that his father, after executing two Brackens, as well as growing so fat that he couldn't stand without aid, never came to visit again. And it doesn't really look like Agor returned to court until after the unworthy passed. So let's move on to part two, the great bastards at court, 184 to 196. It was two years later. Daron, now King Daron, invited Agor and the others to court following his father's death. Now, a suspicious mind might have well suspected a trap. Why would Daron want to invite the boy who was almost pushed ahead of him in the line of succession? The Brackens were rivals, if not enemies, of King Daron back when he was Prince Daron. The Martells would likely bear a grudge as well. And, as we all know, King Aegon the Unworthy legitimized his bastards on his deathbed, so Agor was arguably a bigger threat than ever. And Damon was invited too? And Brynden would be there? Was he t aiming to take them all out in one fell swoop under the guise of friendship? Well, no. <laughs> King Daron was a man of faith, mercy, and peace. His biggest influence by far was his uncle Baylor the Blessed, not his father, <laughs> Aegon the Unworthy. So he didn't have any of them killed, nor does it appear they were even held against their will. Yeah, and they were still somewhat young at this point. It's not clear when Daron invited them all to court, but if it was soon after Aegon's death, which is pretty reasonable to assume, it was in around 184 to 185. And at that time, Damon was 14 to 15, Aegor 12 or 13, Brendan 9 or 10, and Shira was probably around three. One big happy family. <laughs> right. <laughs> Blackfire backfire. <laughs> Daron probably hoped to befriend his younger legitimized half-brothers and sister, plus any others not named in the histories. He may not have thought it likely, but he may have been thinking along the lines of, if I can't make them into friends, at least I'll be keeping my enemies close. This plan did not work. And in fact, it may have helped create the very problem that Daron was trying to prevent. By returning to King's Landing, Igor had the chance to pursue ambitions long desired but denied to his family, and to make connections with important figures who could help advance those aims. If Agor had been left at Stonehenge by Daron, he may never have become close to Damon Blackfire. And without that, Agor probably never marries Damon's daughter, let alone convinces him to rebel. Likewise, he would not have met Shiera Seastar, so falling for her wouldn't have happened either. Nor would he have developed such a rivalry with Bloodraven, though he'd still hate him since he was a Blackwood, but still, it would be less intense. When Bettershield comes to mind, I suspect most think of his prowess as a warrior and commander, his unwavering devotion to his goals, his endless anger, the mm -hmm. Golden Company. But he was also an effective manipulator and an expert intriguer, which may or may not be a real word. <laughs> <laughs> intriguer, I, I think that's a word. <laughs> yeah, right. So he's perhaps not on the level of a Varys or a Littlefinger, but maybe he was. Yeah, he might have been. Throughout this episode, you'll see some pretty stunning examples of this. And in the next episode, too. A lot of things that strings he seemed to be able to pull, maybe, you know? Some of it's kind of hard to tell, but it seems he was really, really good at it. As it was with many of the defining relationships in his life, quite a few of Agor's most exceptional skills were acquired at the Red Keep. He had been exposed to intrigue by his Bracken family at an early age, but there's no place like the Red Keep for mm -hmm. learning how to plot manipulate, and scheme. Also at court, one needs allies. And since Agor proved aware and adept at networking and building alliances and coalitions later in life, it makes a lot of sense to guess that court is where he learned this lesson. Yeah, it does make a lot of sense. Daron the Good had peace in mind, and I think that he was one of the better Targaryen kings of all time, but he screwed this situation up badly, I think. Instead of getting close to Daemon and Agor, they got close to each other. Now, <laughs> Damon and Agor would have had a lot in common, but I have to wonder how it went at first. Was Agor angry that Damon had taken his place as the eldest bastard son of King Aegon? Was Damon's legendary charisma so powerful that even Bittersteel's equally legendary anger swept was swept aside? We just don't know. But they grew close, whether right away or over time. I mean, it's easy to see why, at least on paper. They were half-brothers, of course, and very close in age. Both grew to hate that they were bastards, despite being legitimized, and both were warriors. Both were men of the sword. <laughs> Learn from the best. How did Bittersteel become such a badass? Well, he was tall and strong, that helped a lot, but that's clearly genetics. If we're talking about learned skills, things he worked for, we credit two main sources. The first is Sir Quentin Ball, better known as Fireball. 
Now, I swear, the characters around that time had just about the coolest names. Dunk asks Egg... From the Sworn Sword. Why did they call him Fireball? For his hot head and red hair. Sir Quentin Ball was the master at arms at the Red Keep. He taught my father and my uncles how to fight. The great bastards, too. His father and uncles includes Makar and Baylor Breakspear, and he would later become Damon Blackfire's top general. So while the master at arms for the Brackens was probably no slouch, there's pretty much no chance he was even close to Fireball's level. In other words, Bittersteel learned from the best. He also learned with the best. It's hard to get better at anything competitive when you're never actually tested. No doubt Fireball knew this and had them train against each other. He is the second source that we credit. There is always someone quicker and stronger. Sir Roderick had once told John and Rob, he's the man you want to face in the yard before you need to face his like upon a battlefield. Now that was from John Six, A Dance with Dragons. And basically, in other words, Agor's teenage years were spent learning to fight against the likes of Baylor and Makar, Damon and Brynden. That's quite a collection of talent. Agor was in the middle of this group in age, meaning that he was more likely to have fought them all. Damon may not have sparred much with Makar, for example, since the age gap was just too large. Right. Damon alone turned out to be one of the best ever, and Bittersteel spent many of his teen years practicing against him. Accepting Damon, fighting against these particular men would continue for Bittersteel in later life as three of the f these four that we mentioned became enemies. So instead of play fighting with those men, the fighting would be real. But they would already know each other a bit. Like, yeah. they know each other's tendencies. It's pretty interesting. Yeah, the scheming would be real, too. Mm -hmm. Bittersteel honed his considerable intrigue skills by going up against Blood Raven his entire adult life. Bittersteel was constantly facing an opponent at least as skilled, possibly more so than himself, all the while outgunned in the resource department. Yeah, one wonders whether they schemed against one another as teenagers, right? <laughs> the Blackwood Bracken Prejudice would be there, and I bet they tried to hurt each other for real with these wooden practice swords. <laughs> and all this was before they started fighting over Shiera Seastar. This could not have happened early on because of her youth. From the Targaryen kings in the world of ice and fire, Serene was the most beautiful of Aegon's mistresses, but she was also reputed to be a sorceress. She died giving birth to the last of the king's bastard children, a girl called Shiera Seastar, who became the greatest beauty in the Seven Kingdoms. Beloved of both her half-brothers, Bittersteel and Bloodraven, whose rivalry would ripen to hatred. Even if the two of them started chasing her when she was as young as 12? Well, that wouldn't be until the early mid-190s. I guess about 194. Right now, we're still in the mid-180s, when Shiera would have been a newcomer to walking. <laughs> Teen bitter steel. During that interim before Shiera, Agor and Brynden would have been growing into manhood themselves, alongside Damon and Baylor, but also other notables like Baylor's brothers, the future kings Ares I, and Makar, Rhaegal, who was probably insane, mm -hmm. and other young notables at court, which is important to remember. Much is made of Aegor versus Brynden, and rightly so, but this was a diverse group of nobles at court. More diverse than ever, most likely. Yeah, but it was also yet another way in which Daron's mercy worked against him. Court is the only place in Westeros where you can consistently find important members from houses all over Westeros. Aegor proved to be effective at coalition building, as we said before, and there's just no way he could have had access to so many lords and ladies if Daron had just left him <laughs> simmering at Stonehenge. Remember that one of the complaints against Daron the Good was the influence of the Dornish, who had been a rival kingdom for so long. Only recently, three years into Daron's reign, did his sister Daenerys marry Prince Maron Martell. Yeah, Aegor would have been around 15, almost certainly not yet a knight himself. Daemon would be unhappy about this marriage, and I would really love to know what Aegor had to say to him. Somehow, I kind of doubt that he was offering comfort, <laughs> but he may have shared his brother's sense of injustice. Yeah, there was still a lot of bad blood between various Dornish houses and those in the Reach, Stormlands, and elsewhere. Yet nobles from these houses coexisted at Daron's court. Aegor, no doubt, formed important connections with other young nobles, connections which later turned into Blackfire supporters. We don't know which houses fall into this category, but there are a few I can imagine fitting quite well. So how did he do this? Well, if he was truly an expert manipulator, we can guess that he took advantage of the bad blood around court. As someone who grew up in the Riverlands, he was a little less likely to have prejudice against the Dornish, but he could pretend to feel that way. Yeah, or maybe he really did. <laughs> and or he could play on the Dornish sense of unwelcome. As a bastard himself, he could claim to know how they feel. I imagine he was really good at appealing to other people's grievances because he nursed his own so much. He was practiced at it. 
Friends now? Allies later. So who were all these people he interacted with at Daron's court? We can only guess for the most part, but we've got some good ones. Yeah, I think there's a lot to be said for the connection that Agor seemed to have had with the Ironwoods. So perhaps they were one of the Dornish houses with an important member at court. Now, it's pure speculation, but it makes quite a bit of sense. With the Martells rising so high, the Ironwoods would likely side, or at least consider siding with, anyone who could take them back down a peg or two. Yeah. From the Soiled Knight of Dance with Dragons. It's home they want as much as gold. Lord Ironwood knows that as well as I do. His forebears rode with Bittersteel during three of the Blackfire rebellions. That would be the first, third, and fourth rebellions. So the Ironwoods were clearly very devoted to the Blackfire cause, and though they had reason to unseat their rival Martells, which from their point of view is the most important thing there is, <laughs> the connection could run deeper. We must consider that this devotion also originates in part from friendships made with Damon and Agor at Daron's court many years before. Yeah. Later in life, Bittersteel's connections at court would play an enormous role in the wars to come. Even from far away Essos, long after Damon's death, men in the Red Keep did Agor's work. Knowing someone and having basic insight as to their personality and ambitions is a huge leg up. That alone can count for a lot, but a real friendship can change the course of a war or determine whether one even starts in the first place. Hmm. It's also an oft underappreciated factor in deciding who sides with whom. Stannis tells Davos that choosing between his brother and his king was one of the hardest choices he ever had to make, which is another way of saying that had his own house not been one of the rebel houses, Stannis would have fought for Ares. Hmm. It was loyalty to his blood, his house, his brother, that drove him to break his oath to House Targaryen. But that's a blood bond, and blood is one thing, while friendships are another. Some are stronger than blood, or close enough, and often they have a huge impact. In terms of A Song of Ice and Fire, there's probably no better example than Ned Stark and Robert Baratheon. Robert would likely never have considered Ned Stark for Hand of the King had he not known him so well when he was younger. And Robert makes it clear that he needs someone that he can trust, and Ned is his top pick. That was not flattery, that was just the plain truth. Ned Stark absolutely was the man Robert could trust the most in terms of loyalty. This is entirely because of their past relationship, which started at court. The Eerie, that is, not King's Landing, but still at court. Yeah, a court. <laughs> <laughs> we have no idea who was friends with whom at Daron's court. We only know which sides a lot of them, not nearly all, ended up on. But it's still something that we wanted to draw a lot of attention to, the fact that these friendships and bonds of loyalty most certainly did exist, and these early years at Daron's new style court were likely the most formative in that regard. In turn, these connections would have had a lot to do with who was for the Red Dragon and who was for the Black. I like to think Bittersteel understood this fairly well, even at a young age, because it seems to have been a mistake his own family made, and he could have learned from that. His mother and grandfather made their move to supplant the queen when she was on her deathbed, but they lacked the alliances at court to survive the backlash against them when it failed. And they may have lacked the alliances needed to pull it off even had the queen not survived. So we see the power of friendships and blood relationships and their power and potential to change the Game of Thrones. There is, as there so often is, however, a flip side to this coin. As much as you can expect people to choose one side or the other based on what side their friends and allies have chosen, you just as often see people choose sides based on what their enemies have chosen. <laughs> and just as the friendships made early in life can be defining, well, the same can be said for early life rivals and early life loves. Part 3. Becoming Bittersteel. Shiera Seastar. And now a shout out to our Patreon sellsword captains. Each sellsword captain receives episodes seven days early, as well as this periodic shout out of their name and title. Peter Blaze of the Emerald Isle, Captain of the Werewood Wanderers, to Long Lives, Quick Deaths, Cold Beer, and Warm Women. Dagron, Marshal of the Axe, Captain of the Red Tide, Resistance is Futile. Gary and Pike, Wielder of Grave Embrace of Valyrian Steel Axe, and Captain of the Iron Wave, Iron's Kiss is Eternal. Chiron Kalsbane, Captain of the Stone Shields, The Torrent Breaks Upon the Stone. Captain Kithic Deadeye of the Scarlet Longbows, Pierced by Darkness. Jael, Captain of the Burning Shadows, Victory in Ashes. And Kerbouchard, Captain of the Walking Drum, Yol Balsan, May There Be a Road. And Lady Nightwind, Captain of Lucifer's Handmaidens, Bleeding Stars, Bleeding Foes, Forging Lightbringer, One Victim at a Time. The Kingbreaker, A Dance with Dragons.
Daenerys Targaryen loved her captain, but that was the girl in her, not the queen. Prince Rhaegar loved his lady Lyanna, and thousands died for it. Daemon Blackfire loved the first Daenerys, and rose in rebellion when denied her. Bittersteel and Bloodraven both loved Shiera Seastar, and the Seven Kingdoms bled. The Prince of Dragonflies loved Jenny of Oldstone so much that he cast aside a crown, and Westeros paid the bride price in corpses. So Barristan is ruminating on famous romances that caused major problems for the realm, and two of them play out at Dare on the Good's court. Not quite at the same time, probably about a decade apart, but still a very interesting tidbit. Now we covered Daenerys and Daemon in prior episodes, so we know Barrison is exaggerating when he says that it was the cause of the war. Really, it was one of many. Likewise, the Blackfire Rebellions would have happened with, without Shiera Seastar's presence. But nonetheless, Bittersteel and Bloodraven's competition for her favor was still a very, very important part of their dynamic, or so we're told by Barristan and others. Yeah. As we guessed earlier, Aegor and Brynden probably began to fight over Shira around 194. By then, he'd be Sir Aegor, 22, and by Westerosi standards, well into manhood. It would be cool to learn who knighted him. I guess Sir Quentin Ball, but Damon Blackfire is an interesting possibility as well. Now, we don't have any details, nor much insight into Shira, especially at such a young age. Other than that, she was incredibly beautiful. She was supposedly into the occult, but at 12-ish? Maybe not that early. But maybe. For the same reason we're dubious that Aegor had a lot of friends, it's doubtful Aegor's angry, chip-on-his-shoulder disposition worked to his benefit with regards to Shiera. He made connections at court, he was a man to respect, a man to follow, and a man to fear. But probably not a man to love. He had a lot of attractive qualities, though. He was tall, handsome, skilled, intelligent, but Shiera could have had whoever she wanted. And who wants to be with someone who's pissed all the time? Eh, who knows? Maybe she somehow found bitterness sexy. But <laughs> apparently she just really liked albinos even more. <laughs> she did apparently revel in men fighting over her. And what better rivalry to inflame than Bracken Blackwood? Yeah. Either way, <laughs> she chose Blood Raven, and another huge log was added to the roaring inferno of Aegor's bitterness. Yeah. When plotting the Blackfire return to the Seven Kingdoms, among other things, Bittersteel most likely thought of slaying Blood Raven, and then, well, what about Shiera? Aegor was married by then, so maybe he wanted to rub it in her face that she chose the wrong man. <laughs> and by it, I mean Blood Raven's head. <laughs> That's the kind of revengey thing I can imagine him daydreaming about. One day I'll cut his head off and make her a gift of it. Probably wouldn't dip it in gold first either. <laughs> maybe in lead or tar, probably. Tar, tar, yeah. Yeah, you maybe wanted to preserve the albino Something look. Something entirely yeah. more unpleasant. <laughs> <laughs> Bitterathian. <laughs> Just as parts, or all, of his personality were probably not so appealing to Shiera, he probably wasn't so appealing in general. In that regard, anyway. Again, he had a ton of leadership qualities and all that. We're dubious that Aegor had true friends, though. There's no doubt he was a leader and many followed him, but it strikes me as more likely that he commanded respect through his prestigious skills and determination, all the while fanning the flames of loyalty to someone who did inspire true devotion, Damon Blackfire. Yeah, Damon may have been an exception. I mean, there's a lot for them to have bonded over. They were a similar age, they had similar status, etc. Yeah, cetera. This, this brings us back to Robert and Stannis because there's a strong parallel here. Think of Robert as Damon. We've already made this comparison, it's really easy to see. Ultra badass, ultra charismatic, dragon blood, made a play for the throne, etc. Obviously there are major differences too, but these major overlaps are where we want to draw your attention at the moment. Yeah, because comparing Bittersteel to Stannis worked really well in so many ways, which makes both parallels even cooler and stronger. Now, both Stannis and Aegor were humorless, constantly angry, seemingly easy to, do, to offend. Yeah. Both were overshadowed by an older brother who was immensely popular and well-loved. Stannis gritted his teeth over this and went about his business. He backed his brother. Bittersteel? He seems to have done basically the same. He backed his brother too. Though Stannis aimed to seat himself and Aegor a relative. Both failed in their bids to win the throne, but survived to continue the fight, never giving up even when the odds seemed terrible. Yeah, we'll compare him to Stannis again, so we should probably suggest a few other characters that he remembers, that he resembles as well, to round things out. Now, there are quite a few characters with very striking parallels. John Connington comes to mind, mm -hmm. and Randall Tarly, and a bit of Viserys Targaryen even. Just a bit. <laughs> now, we'll explore these comparisons more throughout the episode. Aegor in the middle. You can start to see a few middle child syndrome things happening here. Aegor wasn't technically such, 
but among the three male great bastards, he was. He's not as handsome, charismatic, or skilled as older half-brother Damon, as well as with lesser blood and not as favored as younger Brendan, who was never sent away from court that we know of. <laughs> and Brendan and Damon actually knew and spent considerable time with their mutual father, while Aegor barely knew him. Damon's mother was another Targaryen, sister to the famous King Daron the Young Dragon. And Brendan's mother was loved and well-remembered by all the king's court. Where... Aegor's was the overreaching and shamed Barba Bracken, whose family was also well remembered by all the king's court, but for a scandal that led to the executions and torture. Uh, Damon, of course, received the famous sword Blackfire, and at some point, perhaps not until after the rebellion, Brendan got Dark's sister. They got sweet pieces of steel, while Aegor got bitter steel. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> Brendan had a private bodyguard, his raven's teeth, that he definitely had before the red grass field since they fought in the battle with him. So, his elder brother had more advantages and natural-born greatness, and his younger brother had more privileges. Both of their mothers were held in higher regard than Aegor's at court and in Westeros at large. Basically everything. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing how many extremely compelling reasons exist for Bittersteel to be who he is. There is a litany of reasons for him to be resentful. We don't know when he actually got the name Bittersteel, but man, it describes him well. <laughs> His personality makes perfect sense given the conditions, environment, and influences he had at a young age. Bitter marriage. In addition to all the things we named that his brothers got that he didn't, there was this. Damon married the daughter of the Archon of Tyrosh, an extremely rich and powerful ally. King Aegon had arranged this betrothal during his life, and King Daron followed through with his late father's promise. Now, Aegor was not given any marriage offers from Daron that we know of, and meanwhile, Shiera chose Bloodraven over him. He may have felt stinted by Daron, and perhaps overshadowed in general in the love department and elsewhere, but he was clearly still pretty formidable. It's not like he was being outshined by Pot Pie. This is Damon, Blackfire, and Blood Raven that we're talking about. Hey, what's so what's so weak about Hot Pie? Who's <laughs> making fun of Hot Pie here? It's unclear what kind of relationship he had with Daron, but it probably wasn't great. As good of a king as he was, Agor was a Bracken, and it was the Brackens who had tried to supplant him and his cherished mother Nerys. Worse, it was Agor who Aegon the Unworthy threatened to supplant him with. This was not Aegor's fault, nor his design, he was a mere child after all, but it's still not consu conducive to friendship and trust, etc. Again looms our guess that Bittersteel wasn't terribly likable also, so he was convincing though. So there's a strong impression given that Aegor was flat out good at talking. Aegor may have been one of those critical of Daron's policies, and he doesn't seem like the type to have been shy about it. Yeah, but I doubt that he had a lot of sway over King Daron. Daron probably just didn't listen to Aegor much. His brother Damon, on the other hand, Aegor clearly had a lot of say in two of Damon's biggest life decisions. The marriage of his eldest daughter and, of course... From the world of ice and fire, the Targaryen kings. Years had passed since the first men approaching Damon in the actual rebellion. What, then, tipped Damon over into proclaiming for the throne? It seems likely it was another of the great bastards, Sir Aegor Rivers, called Bittersteel. Perhaps it was his bracken blood that made Aegor so choleric and so quick to take offense. Perhaps it was the ignominious fall of the brackens in King Aegon's esteem, leading to his exile from Aegon's court. Or perhaps it was only his rivalry with his half-brother and fellow bastard Brynden Rivers, who had been able to maintain his close relations at court. For Bloodraven's mother had been well-loved during her life, and was fondly remembered, so the Blackwood did not suffer as the brackens did when the king cast off his respective mistresses. Whatever the case may be, Aegor Rivers soon began to press Daemon Blackfire to proclaim for the throne, and all the more so after Daemon agreed to wed his eldest daughter Kala to Aegor. Bitter his steel may have been, but worse was his tongue. He spilled poison in Daemon's ear, and with him came the clamoring of other knights and lords with grievances. So the betrothal, it had to be a betrothal given that Kala was too young for marriage, enabled Aegor greater leeway to push Daemon towards rebellion. This is why we think that Aegor had more to do with pushing Daemon than anyone else. They were close, possibly very close, and there is a lot of circumstantial evidence suggesting that Aegor was a convincing guy who didn't give up easily. 
Bitter Steel had as much, possibly the most, to do with convincing Damon to rebel. Sometimes we're told Bitter Steel joined the rebellion, which he did, but this is misleading because we believe he was the most aggressive in pushing Damon towards it. At the very least, he was closer to him personally than the other conspirators, and that says a lot. So if Damon were Aegon the Conqueror, Aegor was his Ores. Ores and Aegon shared a father, one fully Valyrian, the other half. Ores had black hair, just like Aegor. Maybe Aegor expected to be made hand, or to be given Storm's End. <laughs> That's right, yeah. The pressure from Aegor was family pressure and from the man he probably had the most common with in the world. Few know what it's like to be simultaneously held in the highest regard for the station of their parents while being shunned because said parents were not married. Darren also was not a man of the sword. Daemon and Aegor and Brendan were. And that's an understatement. Having great genes and all the best training available will take you far, but there's a special kind of motivation that comes from that same royal bastard social dichotomy. The implied social message for the male great bastards was, Westeros expects you to be great, but you'll always be second class. George says Damon eventually came to resent his status as a bastard. And maybe that's in part because eventually Bittersteel was always there to point out the slights. Together, they may have commiserated on what it would be like to be given their due status. You can see why we think Aegor was the prime mover. And no one knows when the decision to rebel had been made, but as we do know, Blood Raven discovered the plan. Damon was nearly captured, but did escape thanks to Fireball. We don't hear of Aegor being around. He may have already been making moves before the announcement of Damon's claim since it had already been decided that it would happen. His hated Blackwood brother had interfered and the stakes of their rivalry increased significantly. It wasn't over a woman this time though. It was for the Iron Throne. Part four, at last, rebellion, 196. Now what followed, we've been over. There's no real need for us to re-describe the entire first Blackfire Rebellion or the Battle of Redgrass Field, but we can add a few more details from Bittersteel's perspective. Given Damon's narrow escape from the Red Keep with, it, with the help of Fireball, when his plans to rebel were discovered, we're guessing Bittersteel was elsewhere, since he's not mentioned as part of it. Aegor at war. We would dearly love to know where he was when the rebellion broke out and what he did first. If he was at Stonehenge, which is a pretty good guess, I suppose, we'll repeat a different guess that we made before, that Bittersteel went straight for the nearby and loathsome Blackwoods. Now I'd laugh my ass off if it turned out priority number one was returning Missy's teats to Barba's possession. <laughs> the so, war of the teats. Yeah. <laughs> so we don't know where Agor was, but we have a pretty good idea of what he looked like. George has given us a description of how Bittersteel dressed for war. His armor is well made, but plain. No nonsense gray steel and black rings. His helm bears a horse-head crest with a horse's mane flowing down behind. Now, that sounds pretty badass. It's mm. not fancy, but with that helm and his height, he'd stand out a pretty good amount anyway, I would think. Yeah, me too. We'd also love to know which houses he rallied to the Blackfire cause. Given his ability to convince and manipulate, he may have had a lot to do with bringing support to the Black Dragon. I suspect he was quite good at it. Damon had the true charisma, and we're told men flock to his banner, but the man couldn't be everywhere at once, and charisma doesn't work quite as well at a distance. But knowing how to play on common grievances, knowing how to spin conflict into injustice, there are other ways to go about it, to be sure. From Aegor's lips, King Daron's reasonable treatment of Damon may have been spun to look as bad as Mad King Aerys's worst. He could use every trick in the book, like a politician, telling them what they want to hear or what he knows will get a rise. We're speculating, of course, but these are small leaps, like assuming there's a fire because we see smoke. Bittersteel was also clearly a natural leader. The main leaders in the battle for the Black Side were Damon himself, Lord Gorman Peak, who was from an ancient noble house, and Bittersteel. So, despite being a bastard and of far lesser rank than the kingly Damon of or Lord Gorman, whose family held three, three castles, Sir Agor Rivers was one of the men in charge. Think about how rare that is in Westeros. Men of rank and high standing very often cannot bear even the suggestion of being led by someone of lesser rank, let alone a bastard, legitimized or no. It's, and it becomes clear later that even despite his legitimization, and with Blood Raven and Damon, people still, the bastard stigma hung over them all, regardless. To make it more impressive, Aegor was only about 24 when he led the, the, the rear at the red grass field. So this really speaks to what a strong personality he had. Aegor was probably pretty scary. An intimidating, intense persona. Someone whose skills were respected despite lack of real experience. Again, like Stannis or say Randall Tarly. Yeah, 
Quite a few reasons in play here to explain why he earned respect and not love. Men like Tywin Lannister are proof that charisma isn't the only way to win allies and followers. Thanks in part to the lessons of the Reigns and Tarbacks, the line of Lannister, whether seen at court or in the battlefield, is a sigil that commands respect and inspires fear. Dragon Horse! <laughs> so, speaking of sigils and the things that they inspire, let's check out Bittersteel's. We don't have any idea when he came up with it. He, and probably his mother, would not have wanted him to be plain amidst all of the heraldry and spectacle of the court, especially Daron's, which again was perhaps the most diverse court ever seen to that point. But he was not a knight when he first came back to court, and the squires typically don't have a custom coat of arms, and he may not have even been a squire. This sigil, which you can see here, if you're especially, even if you're listening on iTunes, if you're using the free Acast player, which I highly recommend because we've been putting visual goodies in even for people who get the audio-only podcasts. This, you can see here, displays his dual Bracken and Targaryen heritage very clearly. I mean, look at that thing. It's so metal. <laughs> it even looks angry like him. I can kind of imagine, like, he's telling the painter, you know, Seven save you of the noble Bracken horse on my shield looks happy. He probably doesn't, he's probably uncomfortable saying the word happy. <laughs> as random as it sounds though, this sigil, you know, it actually makes me think of Daenerys getting married of all things. More specifically, when she rides her silver for the first time. This isn't foreshadowing, this isn't a hidden reference, it's just a strong similarity in imagery. I think it's really cool. From Daenerys 2, A Game of Thrones. As she turned to ride back, a fire pit loomed ahead directly in her path. They were hemmed in on either side with no room to stop. A daring she had never known filled Daenerys then, and she gave the filly her head. The silver horse leapt the flames as if she had wings. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah, right? Yeah. So, here's some obscure trivia for you all. This is George R. R. Martin's initial idea for Bittersteel's sigil, and it was a lot simpler as he told artist Amok here. His shield has a gray longsword displayed bendy sinister with a black dragon's head above and a red horse's head below, both facing out. The field is white. And now later he told Amok, never mind, he had come up with something much cooler. Gotta agree. Much cooler. <laughs> Dividing your mother and father's houses on a shield and just crosswise bendy like that, that's like the most standard thing you can do. It's like <laughs> get the khaki pants of sigil designs. The dragon yeah. horse is definitely better. Yeah, definitely, definitely. definitely. <laughs> so, the mad charge. From the sworn sword. There was much and more afterward, I know. I saw a bit of it myself. The rebels running, bitter steel, turning the route and leading his mad charge. His battle with Bloodraven, second only to the one Damon fought with Gwaine Corbray. The dragon horse that marked Bittersteel was seen on the right at the Battle of Redgrass Field. It was seen moving forward when other sigils representing his allies were moving in the other direction away from the battle. In other words, in retreat. Some of those checked their flight and followed as the winged, fire-breathing horse was seen charging towards the spot where Damon Blackfire's body lay still, near Damon's son Aemon. His body, too, was filled with white shafts and held no more life than his father or twin brother. But he was the last to hold the sword Blackfire, which Bittersteel sought. So Bittersteel went towards his mortal enemy Bloodraven, who had slain Daemon and his twin sons from afar with weirwood arrows. Now, anger is a destructive emotion, but it can often make a foe considerably more dangerous. Consider, too, that Daemon may have been a real friend to Aegor, perhaps his only one? And you can see that he'd be very dangerous in this moment. It is hard to imagine Bloodraven being caught completely off guard by Bittersteel's assault on his position, meaning Aegor and those who followed his mad charge may have withstood a volley or two from the raven's teeth, which is no joke. Again, with his distinct sigil and horsehair crest helm, Bittersteel could be singled out more than most, I would think. I think we can guess who Bloodraven took aim at, <laughs> assuming he had a shot. But if any arrows found their mark, Bittersteel remained inexorable, apparently not seriously wounded, if at all. The fate of Damon and his sons would not be Aegor's. Indeed, it was Bloodraven who found himself seriously wounded after facing the full force of his half-brother's rage. The Battle of Redgrass Field was a close-run thing, as we know, and coming up short must have been intolerable to Aegor. Yet he clearly hadn't given up. This was not unbridled, unthinking battle fury. He wasn't aiming to go out in a blaze of glory, dying at his brother's side or anything. No, this was hard rationality in the face of a complete collapse. Amidst all the chaos and death around him, he somehow saw clearly that it was not over. There was one chance to keep the Blackfire cause from dying forever, and he seized that chance. 
With quick thinking and anger-fueled bravery, he turned a rout into a charge, turned a lost cause into a 60-year-plus threat to the stability of the Iron Throne and House Targaryen, all while sticking it to his personal arch enemy, <laughs> literally. Now, we don't know exactly how it played out, of course, but somehow Bittersteel recovered Blackfire, fought Blood Raven at close quarters, and then fled when Baylor and Makar pulled off the hammer and anvil man maneuver, crushing the rebel ar army. Now, Agor got in a parting shot, though. The literary symbolism is overflowing here. Bittersteel, defying the notion that the Black Dragon was over and done for, drove the symbol of the Blackfire cause into Blood Raven's eye, emphatically <laughs> declaring to his brother that this, this is far from over. Yeah, it's rich, rich stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so, maybe they fought in silence. And maybe it was over in seconds. But I think it's cool to imagine the things they might have said to one another as they wheeled and circled on horseback, certainly dripping with sweat, possibly covered in blood. What sort of curses and threats and deadly promises burst forth from their lips in these desperate moments? I can picture Bittersteel calling his brother a coward for killing him from a for killing Damon from afar and a kinslayer. Blood Raven would certainly hear that latter charge many, many times. Whatever they said, it would be not safe for work. Let's say. <laughs> Blood Raven could fire back with cries of traitor before the inevitable cry of pain that came when his eye was pierced. Blood Raven would never see out of that eye again, but he spent the rest of his career focused on the man who took it from him. Perhaps a small piece of revenge, this minor satisfaction was something Agor took to heart. Which is a hard thing to do, because, you know, Agor is a bit of a Grinch-like figure with a heart <laughs> three sizes too small. So there's not much room there. Hard target to hit. Uh, but more important than revenge, as sweet as it may be, Bittersteel recovered Blackfire itself, which was the symbol of their cause. With it, they would be able to continue, but only if there were Blackfire heirs left to carry it. He surely knew this, and so did the Loyalists. It must have been no simple thing, then, for him to go collect Damon's other children. It must have been an extremely hurried affair, but perhaps not as simple as it may seem. A Night of Winter Many followers of the Black Dragon were idealists, romantics. Catelyn might call them Knights of Summer. Yeah, think of Brienne before Renly died. How devoted to him she was, and how naive in general they were. And you get that picture. These men, those who survived anyway, now had to face the real world, which was a world without their hero, Damon Blackfire. A world where they were now exiles, never again to see lands and castles held by their families in many cases, for thousands of years. Consider that shame. Hundreds of members of your bloodline held your lands before you, and you're the one who lost it all. Mm. These would be the kinds of thoughts going through the heads of those who survived the red grass field on the losing side. Some couldn't face this, and they bent the knee hoping for mercy. Men may have banked on Daron being a merciful man in general. And some maybe just had too much land to give up on entirely. Yeah, men such as Lord Gorman Peake, commander of the Blackfire Center at the Redgrass Field, who we mentioned before. He lost two of those three castles we mentioned <laughs> and was forced to give over a hostage, perhaps multiples. Yeah, and his punishment was fairly standard, though he was generally shamed by it if mm. Eustace Osgrey's attitude was at all typical. From the Sworn Sword. I should have gone with bitter steel into exile, or died beside my sons and my sweet king. That would have been a death worthy of a checky lion descended from so many proud lords and mighty warriors. Daron's mercy made me smaller. Still, if Lord Gorman, one of the leaders, was allowed to live, it seemed that the limits of Daron's mercy had not been reached, and Blood Raven's calls for severe reprisals were not adopted. But this came later. In the moment, no one knew what the result of a surrender would be. For many, in addition to deciding whether to bend the knee or flee into exile, it was their first taste of defeat. In the songs, the heroes always win. Does this mean the songs were wrong or that they were not the heroes after all? These men never considered losing. They had no concept of what to do. The only losing these types had ever dealt with before, for the most part, was losing an attorney. Luckily for them, they could at least follow a man who knew what to do because Bittersteel was no knight of summer. While everyone else was thinking of themselves, their castles, their honor, their future, all while feeling the shock of the unthinkable that they, that they lost, that Damon's dead, he's, he's gone. They had their heads in the clouds, and those clouds turned into storms. Yeah. Bittersteel grew up in the shadow of failed Bracken ambitions. He was much more of a realist, so his head was nowhere near the clouds. He kept it in the game. Of Thrones. <laughs> Damon was dead, but claims pass on, do they not? 
Bittersteel's new imperative is clear. He had Blackfire the sword, now to gather Blackfire the family. <laughs> Still, while he did wh what he felt he had to do, despite his focus, there had to be other things on his mind. Yeah, like where was Kala, Agor's wife to be? And Barba, his mother, did they accompany him? Did Agor choose to save Damon's sons instead of his wife and mother? I would actually guess that Kala was too young to have been married, as we said before, so it was a betrothal, which means that she was probably still living with her family, which means she was with Bittersteel and her brothers when they fled across the narrow sea. Barba, however... Well, we don't know exactly where Damon's Keep was, but it was along the Blackwater, probably in the Crownlands. The Stonehenge was not on the way. Somehow, Agor made it to Damon's Keep, probably with the remnants of Damon's army, and then to a safe port. Now, it's unclear who else was with him, though notably young Alan Cockshaw has some memory of the event, as he was a childhood friend of Damon II, the new Blackfire claimant. From the Mystery Knight, I wept when Bittersteel carried him off to exile, and again when Lord Peak told me he was coming home. I'm just hoping that we get the rest of that story someday. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> Part 5. Exile to Essos, 197-211. to We don't know where they took ship, or whose ships they were, whether this contingency escape plan existed ahead of time, or whether it was improvised on the spot. We only know where they went. Tyrosh. It was the perfect place to go. Far enough from Westeros to be safe, but not so far that they couldn't remain a strong threat. The Archon of Tyrosh is a powerful man, and the one at the time may have been the grandfather of the Blackfire children, and Agor was married to one of those Blackfire children. Even if it wasn't, the Archons are chosen from the most powerful and wealthy families, so he'd likely be capable of supporting the cause to a great degree if he wanted to. Bottom line, at the very least, it was a safe haven, and with luck, Grandpa would support their cause. We say he may have been the grandfather of, etc., because Damon and Rohan had been married over 12 years, and there may have been a change at the Archon position by then. In fact, it's very likely. We do not have any direct evidence of Tairashi's support during any of the wars, so this is largely an open question. Also, despite being a powerful man, an Archon of Tyrosh does not wield the kind of power that a king does. The Archon is selected by the wealthy families of the city. There aren't really any true ruling dynasties, no massive armies clashing over claims. Not, yeah, none of that sort of thing. It's a different, different type of situation entirely. And these wealthy families are a different kind of nobility, too. Tyrosh is a city of merchants. As silly as it may sound, quite a few lords in Westeros consider money management to be beneath them. It's one of the reasons Littlefinger gets away with so much, because none of these lords have any idea what's going on with finance, for the most part. The buying and selling of goods to make a profit is generally considered to be a middle-class pursuit. Not so in Tyrosh, where it is the noblest of occupations. They can and do fight for territory, but generally the type of conflicts they become embroiled in are of the trade war variety, as opposed to, you know, regular war. <laughs> They'd fight over shipping lanes or trade rights, not, say, for lands and honors held and or claimed by their forebears. Bittersteel may have found himself frustrated by this cultural difference because that's exactly the kind of war that he wanted, <laughs> as well as the kind of justification that he offered. But the justice of the Blackfire cause probably meant very little to the Archon, and probably meant nothing whatsoever to the other big players in Tyrosh. For Bittersteel to get their support, he would have had to promise them opportunities that would lead to wealth. And lots of it. Because war is insanely expensive. And look at the geography. Look how close Tyrosh is to Westeros. See, not far at all. If Tyrosh supports war with the Seven Kingdoms, it's at least a temporary loss of trade with the Seven Kingdoms, yeah. which is probably a huge market. Yeah, in other words, this is a really tough sell. Now, recall these words from way back, from Daenerys II, A Clash of Kings. I have no warships. War is bad for trade. Many times I have told you, Zaro Zoandaxos is a man of peace. Now, the Archon probably does have warships, unlike Zaro, but if he were to use city resources in something that resulted in a loss of wealth, well, the lack of knowledge on Tyrosh comes into play a little bit here, but it's pretty safe to guess that the elite Tyroshi citizenry probably doesn't have to suffer bad rulers for wrong. Right, think Pentos and how they ritually sacrifice princes of Pentos who following lost wars or poor harvests, or or the elections that the, the three-way power sharing and the mere year-long terms that describe the triarchy of Volantis. It's yeah. Tyrosh is probably more like that. <laughs> yeah, and speaking of those cities, Tyrosh was and is often at war with those free cities. Getting into conflict with the Seven Kingdoms might give their more traditional enemies a chance to swoop in. So again, it's just a tough sell all around. Yeah. Meanwhile, back in Westeros, they had not forgotten about Bittersteel and the Blackfires. The threat remained real despite the Blackfires being reduced to black embers. <laughs> yeah. 
Best to completely smother it before someone pours gasoline on it. Yeah, but it's not as if sailing to Tyrosh to slaughter the Archon's grandkids is really an option. Yeah, even if he's merely the former Archon. Yeah. <laughs> Nor would King Daron really be likely to do such a thing were an option anyway. I mean, sure, he faced an unjust rebellion, but he still remained a, a man of peace. Yeah, that's just who he was. Men of peace looked for peaceful ways to resolve problems, and though this attitude had burned him in the past, it had also worked several times, perhaps more often than not. He probably considered the trade angle, and perhaps had emissaries sent to the Archon, gently reminding them of the implied cost of war. It wouldn't be a threat, it would be a rational argument based on bottom lines. Like, the Blackfire cause will bring woe, not wealth. Something like that. However, Tyrosh was connected to the Blackfire cause by blood, so they wouldn't want to lean too heavily on the lack of profit motive argument, just in case. If they even use that argument in the first place. Right. Especially given that most of those in King Daron's court, meaning most of those advising him, would think like Westerosi, not Tairashi. This ties into those cultural differences that we were just getting at. It means that they would overvalue the blood connection, and that would cause them to worry. Hmm. Since straight-up slaughter wasn't possible as a means to remove this threat, the next best option was to weaken it, and that was possible. So Daron the Good did exactly that. As far as the Game of Thrones goes, this is a very smart move. Fight marriage with marriage. Yeah, it's the next best thing to fighting fire with fire. <laughs> King Daron married his grandson, Prince Valar, to Kiera of Tyrosh. We don't know when it happened, but it was almost certainly during this interim period after the First Rebellion. It certainly happened well before Bittersphere founded the Golden Company and before Blood Raven's ascent to Hand of the King, both of which we're still several years away from. Now, we also don't know Kiera's relation to Damon's wife, Rohan. They may have been sisters, but just as easily, Rohan's father could have died during this time and Kiera's father could, could have been the new Archon without any blood ties at all to the Blackfires. Yeah, either way, she must have been very important considering who she married. Right. Prince Valar was no random extra Targaryen male. He was second in the direct line to the throne behind his own father, Baylor Breakspear. So, Kiera of Tyrosh was married to a man who would eventually inherit the Iron Throne, Assuming that he outlived his grandfather and father. I mean, he didn't, as it turned out, but that's another story. <laughs> right. The point is that it shows how important this marriage was. Yeah. After Valar's death in 209, Kiera was remarried to another Targaryen high, though not nearly as high, uh, in the line of succession. Now, this is not the first time that the Targaryens took a bride from the Free Cities, but it's still a pretty unusual thing. Yeah. Power politics generally dictate making marriage alliances within the borders of the Seven Kingdoms. So Tyrosh was indeed a safe haven, but it doesn't look like Aegor could get anything more than safety. Maybe there's more, we're just not aware of it. We're not sure if the Val valar Kiera marriage was a major blow to the Blackfire cause, or if things were already fading fast anyway. Perhaps the marriage was just a way for the Iron Throne to play it safe. Yeah, and it's also possible that King Daron made other moves to check what Aegor and his fellow exiles were doing. Yeah, perhaps they tried to influence the elections. That's a suggestion yeah. from Stephen Atwell. I like that idea. Yeah. Or maybe they just tried to influence her policies. Who knows? Yeah. It's things like that. Now, you might be getting sick of this comparison, but we're going to go there again. <laughs> this quote comes after Pycelle hears that Stannis has sailed away from Dragonstone, and he assumes that the Manus is gone for good. Jamie 9, A Storm of Swords. Did you turn into an utter fool when Tyrion shaved your beard? This is Stannis Baratheon. The man will fight to the bitter end and then some. If he is gone, it can only mean he intends to resume the war. You can't blame us for using that quote. It's got the word bitter in it. <laughs> Seriously, though... Tywin's take on Stannis is exactly how I imagine Blood Raven descri describing the threat that remained in Bittersteel. A lot of the nobility looked at the situation and probably thought Bittersteel was nothing to worry about. Damon's other children were very young. Bittersteel really tried to place a child on the throne? Should we really be all that concerned if he does? Men won't rise for a child king, etc., etc. But looking at bottom lines, just like Tywin was correct, so was Blood Raven. Bittersteel was basically starting from scratch, but neither his determination nor his ability were to be despised. Though he didn't get the support he might have wanted from Tyrosh, he was neither out of options nor allies. Yeah, by then he would have married Cala Blackfire, possibly had children with her. If so, well, that's again another story, but we don't ever hear of them. Male children of his you'd think would fight in the later rebellions, but there's no word of that. If they weren't fighters, perhaps he tried to marry them to some other daughter of Daemon. Female children of his, you'd expect him to try to marry Damon's other sons or grandsons, or to import an exile house. Given time, he'd be a threat again, either way. And sure enough, that's what happened. 
But it took a long time and quite a few things happened during that span. We don't know what those things were, however. <laughs> we only know that Bittersteel, the sons of Damon Blackfire, and the other exiles remained enough of a threat to warrant attention somehow. Later events would prove Bittersteel still had friends at court, but friends at court couldn't address one of the major issues preventing a second attempt at the throne. From the Mystery Knight. Those rebels who survived and bent the knee were pardoned, but some lost land, some titles, some gold. All gave hostages to ensure their future loyalty. The exiles alone would not be enough. They would need former allies to rise again. But clearly, they were forestalled by this hostage situation. From the end of the war in 197 all the way to 209, that's where the balance of power li lied. This was the situation. Yeah, as long as King Darren had hostages, no plan made by mortals would do. Plans made by the gods, though, <laughs> that'll cut it. <laughs> the Great Spring Sickness. To compound the hostage problem, Daron's heir, Baylor Breakspear, was a popular man. Sure, he didn't look like a Targaryen, he looked Dornish, <laughs> but he was handsome and wise and honorable, and perhaps best of all, in terms of Westeros, <laughs> a war hero. But he died in 209, well before his time. From the Blackfire point of view, this by itself was significant, but hardly enough. After all, the Targaryen line was strong even without him, plus Baylor's sons were impressive, and so was his brother Makar, who had sons of his own. The gods seemed to favor Daron's line indeed, despite snatching the prince named for the Targaryen who honored the gods most of all. There would be no Baylor II, and though the realm would mourn, it would otherwise continue on as it had. Later in the year, however... From the world of ice and fire, the Targaryen kings... Then the Great Spring Sickness swept the Seven Kingdoms, affecting all save the Vale and Dorne, where they closed the ports and mountain passes. Worst hit of all was King's Landing. The High Septon, the Seven's voice on Earth, died, as did a third of the most devout and nearly all the Silent Sisters in the city. Worse still, the sons of Baylor Breakspear were among those carried away, as was Daron II, whom many called the Good. He had reigned for five and twenty years, and most of those years saw peace and plenty for the realm. In less than a year, the four Targaryens at the top all died. Six, if you count the stillborn sons that Kiera bore at some point. We're not exactly sure when that was, but either way, the throne passed all the way down to Ares, now Ares I. He inherited a realm in the midst of a crisis, and he was probably not suited to be king under normal circumstances. Perhaps as many as one in five people on the entire continent died with something like 40% dying in King's Landing. That's quite yeah. staggering. Bittersteel's kin were touched as well. The Lord Bracken of this era may have been the same one who went to Mir to hire crossbowmen for Damon Blackfire, only to be delayed by storms missing the Redgrass Field. Regardless, Lord Bracken of 209 survived the Great Spring Sickness, but his heir died. I suspect his heir was at King's Landing as one of those hostages. From the Mystery Night. Many of us had sons and daughters taken to King's Landing to vouchsafe our future loyalty, but most of the hostages perished in the Great Spring Sickness. Our hands are no longer tied. Our time has come. Ares is weak, a bookish man, and no warrior. The commons hardly know him, and what they know they do not like. His lords love him even less. His father was weak as well, that is true. But when his throne was threatened, he had sons to take the field for him. Baylor and Makar, the hammer and the anvil. But Baylor Breakspear is no more and Prince Makar sulks at Summerhall at odds with King and Hand. It lasted past the year 209 into 210. Sir Eustace Osgrey lost his daughter in this matter. She was a hostage, and it sounds like Lord Gorman lost his heir to it as well. He says many of us, and that would explain a lot. The loss of his son might have been part of why his plotting was optimistic to the point of recklessness. And if we truly take the hostage idea all the way, if we really think it through... Take Lord Bracken's heir. Yes, of course, that's that's obvious. But wouldn't the throne take a hostage to check Bittersteel personally as well, if possible? Surely the need wouldn't have escaped King Daron, and Bloodraven would be there to remind him just in case. <laughs> so we have no idea what happened to Lady Barba. She could have died long before, but by 209, by 209 she would have been around 53, so alive is possible as well. And she's the only person who really qualifies as a hostage that the crown could get a hold of for Aegor. Yeah. If so... She almost certainly died with the rest. Yeah. How would Aegor have felt? It's possible the two hadn't communicated in a long period of time, but it's also possible they exchanged messages from time to time. She could be useful in numerous ways by passing information along what's happening in Westeros, uh, if she had her freedom or her life. <laughs> but on a personal level, well, 
We talked about how he might have been very close to Damon, and given that he grew up with his mother, he was probably close to her. He was a hard man, but even hard men feel the loss of their mother. Yeah. Most of them, anyway. <laughs> True. So, by 210, the plague wound down, but the crown lost authority, military strength, and the hostages, which was its great leverage over the Blackfire sympathizers. Judgment of the Gods. From the Sworn Sword. The realm was full of lawless men these days. The drought showed no signs of ending, and small folk by the thousands had taken to the roads, looking for some place where the rain still fell. Lord Bloodraven had commanded them to return to their own lands and lords, but few obeyed. Many blamed Bloodraven and King Ares for the drought. It was a judgment from the gods, they said, for the Kinslayer is accursed. The plague had run for at least a year, and after it came a drought that ran at least two. With drought comes famine. Okay, so we had death and pestilence, and that was followed by famine. So you know what comes next if you're thinking Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, right? <laughs> Obviously, the West Rusty people aren't thinking of the New Testament, but the point is the same. Yeah, from the Targaryen kings in The World of Ice and Fire, hardly had the plague begun to ebb when Dagon Greyjoy, Lord of the Iron Islands, sent ironborn ships reaving all up and down the shores of the Sunset Sea. Yep, there we go, war. <laughs> the king on the Iron Throne is anointed by the High Septon, the Fates, and thus the Seven Gods, endorsement, is part of the deal with being king. Yeah, people accept the king's authority in part because they believe the king has the favor of the gods. Only the Seven can cause plagues and droughts and sudden deaths of kings, and they can cause war as well. And the pervasive belief is that they do these things when they are displeased. From the Sworn Sword, there's truth and truth, Lunk. Some don't serve, he spat. The gods make droughts. A man can't do a bloody buggering thing about the gods. From the standard point of view, those same gods struck down Baylor and his heirs and then didn't let up at the outset of, King of Ares the First reign. The gods were unleashing all the classic nasty things that gods unleash. Bloodraven was named Hand of the King, and he took the brunt of the blame for the ire of the gods, as this septon tells us circa 211. From the Mystery Knight. Shadow came at his command to strangle brave Prince Valar's sons in their mother's womb. Where is our young prince now? Where is his brother, sweet Mataris? Where is good King Daron gone and fearless Baylor Breakspear? The grave has claimed them every one, yet he endures this pale bird with bloody beak who perches on King Ares' shoulder and caws into his ear. The mark of hell is on his face and in his empty eye, and he has brought us drought and pestilence and murder. Rise up, I say, and remember our true king across the water. Seven gods there are, and seven kingdoms, and the black dragon sired seven sons. Rise up, my lords and ladies! Rise up, you brave knights and sturdy yeomen, and cast down Bloodraven, that foul sorcerer, lest your children and your children's children be cursed forevermore. Amazing. Fifteen years after Damon Blackfire's death, and people are talking openly of the Black Dragon's return. And it's not like they know that these seven sons are anything like their father. They could all just be little book nerds for all they know. Well, like us, right? <laughs> Bittersteel had to be aware of all these rumors and this talk about the king and the hand being unfit. If it wasn't common knowledge, informers would have told him, surely. Yeah, picture Illyrio telling Danny and Viserys that the commoners were secretly sewing dragon banners... Except true. <laughs> yes, <laughs> except true. With sentiment like that, with the hostage threat removed, with the Iron Throne unpopular and weak, with Daemon's sons all grown up, and the gods themselves seemingly against the Targaryens, it was time to strike. Part 6. The Second Blackfire Rebellion. <laughs> 211. Daemon was a warrior king, whose claim to the throne was in part due to his famous sword. Not only would a child not do, they needed to answer this question put to Lord Gorman by key conspirator Black Tom Heddle. Is the boy his father's son? So, for Bittersteel and the Blackfires, quite a lot depended on the character of who came next. Right. If Damon II was a coward like Ares I, or a peacenik like Daron II, they'd be unlikely to rally enough support to take the Iron Throne, no matter how ripe the situation may seem. Recall that one of the many problems preventing another rebellion was the ages of Damon's children. But by 211, Damon's children were no longer children. It had been 15 years, so even if one of them had been a newborn, it would be 15 now. So before looking at how their attempts went, we should take a look at the Blackfire family itself after this time. Blackfire Patriarch. The eldest of Damon's remaining five sons was Damon II. But 
he was probably not the eldest Blackfire. Bittersteel had married Calla Blackfire, Damon II's sister, and almost certainly his elder. There was at least one other sister, perhaps multiple others, and Damon II's four other brothers. Hagon, Aenys, and, well, we, we don't know the youngest son, the youngest two. Sons six and seven. We can call them six gone and seven gone. <laughs> but we will have little reason to refer to them in general, which is too bad because I kind of like those names. <laughs> There's a reason George R. R. Martin hasn't bothered to give their real names, I guess. Yeah. The point is, though, that there were quite a few Blackfires. Yeah. We'd love to hear about all the possible marriage alliances considered and perhaps even consummated, as well as what kids they ended up having and what became of all of them. What of the possibility that Bittersteel had kids with Kala? I would think he'd try to remarry any children of his back in the Blackfire line, and perhaps his descendants still exist in the Song of Ice and Fire today. Surely there are some amazing stories yet to be told. So, there's a lot that we know, but there's even more that we just don't. One thing that you would expect, despite Kala being his elder, is that Daemon II would be head of his family. Oldest male, Blackfire, old enough. That's how it works, right? Guess not. It's pretty clear that Bittersteel was the true patriarch. He was in charge when they were all kids and never really let go, I guess. Rohan of Tyrosh, the mother of all Blackfires, may have had considerable influence as well, but we just don't know. We don't have anything to go on with her. Like, she may have been dead by this time. Yeah, she may have clashed with Agor a bit or maybe backed him. Who knows? It would be pretty interesting to know what she thought of her daughter's marriage to Agor in the first place. Thanks to the weirdness that always comes with these incestuous relationships, Agor was both half-uncle and good brother, you know, brother-in-law, to Damon and Rohan's children. You know, incestuous exile family? I think that they needed their own wacky sitcom. Incestuous exile family. <laughs> you can, this, the theme song writes itself. <laughs> uh, though it could have been another of the exiles, I wonder if Bittersteel trained Damon's sons at arms himself. That's a cool idea. <laughs> this is where he really reminds me of John Connington, right? An exile in Essos, great commander and warrior, trying to seed his son of a close friend of his on the Iron Throne, raising that son from a young age. I don't think Bittersteel was quite as into Damon as John Conning was into Rhaegar, though. Yeah, but they had, you know, but they were both equally angry. <laughs> yeah, but more importantly, John Connington only has one descendant of Rhaegars to worry about. Of Rhaegars, uh, his eggs are in one basket. <laughs> Bittersteel, on the other hand, had a whole mess of Blackfires, and he seemed to handle each one differently. Hmm. Damon the Dreamer, since Damon the Second was seven when his father and elder brothers died. He was also seven when he was taken to Essos by Bittersteel. From an early age, he would have, like Agor himself, been raised in an environment overshadowed by failed dynastic ambitions. Even Bittersteel got to stay on his home continent. <laughs> it would be 15 years before Damon II, however, would return to Westeros himself. He had a lot of time to dwell on his family, his ambitions, and perhaps his sense of duty as the eldest male Blackfire. Yeah, like Aegon VI, or Young Griff, Damon II was charming and well-spoken, perhaps more so than his father. He looked fully Targaryen, but his father was on the godlike side of things. Damon II merely stood out. <laughs> he was brave and seemed to have at least some measure of skill, though he was clearly not in his father's league in that department either. I mean, who was? Now, Damon was gay, but that didn't stop Renly from amassing a huge following. Yeah, Damon was no Renly though, apparently. When <laughs> the time came, Bitter still did not support him, nor did the other exiles. Rohan probably did, were she alive. It's her son, after all. But that might be about it. His brothers did nothing, as far as we can tell. Nor his Tairashi family as, as well. We can't be sure why. And Maester Yandel suggests maybe it was the homosexuality, but I doubt it. His sexual orientation paled in comparison to his most outstanding trait. He was a dragon dreamer. And apparently a rather prolific one. He claimed to have dreamed that his brothers were dead, and that came true. He later dreamed of Ser Duncan in the Kingsguard, and that came true too many years later. He also saw a dragon hatching at the Castle White Walls, which is in the Riverlands, held by House Butterwell. The Butterwells did indeed have a dragon's egg. It was given to them by none other than Damon II's grandfather, King Aegon the Unworthy. That guy again. Somehow Lord Gorman heard this, probably from the secret Blackfire website forums, <laughs> and, and just completely latched onto this idea for some reason. Maybe he was thinking over much of Daenys the Dreamer and her predictions of the doom. But... Yeah. yeah, he was certainly very Melisandre-like in his conviction. Despite prophecies and dreams being unreliable, he was confident that this one was right on the money. 
I have a guess that Bittersteel and perhaps the other Black Fires had a lot of experience with Damon II in his dreams. They grew up with him, and he's clearly been having them since a young age. They probably had a sense of how accurate he really was. Someone like Gorman Peak would not. And I think this is at the heart of the matter. Yeah, it really is telling that Damon II came over alone. Mm. The Peaks are a really big deal, though. And Lord Gorman Peak was ready, even if others were not. In him... I guess you could say Damon II found a partner that was a bit of a dreamer himself, mm -hmm. just not in the magical sense. So he began to make preparations and plotted, coming up with a plan that Damon II Blackfire, who was ready to follow in his father's footsteps, accepted. We're not sure when Damon II and Lord Gorman began communicating, but Damon was 22 by the time he crossed the Narrow Sea from Tyrosh. So he had been old enough to claim the throne for a while, it was more a case that other conditions were not conducive. But as you know, as we just explained, that had changed. The conditions were now good. Damon crossed the Narrow Sea, met up with the man he called Gormy, and set their plan into motion. The tourney at White Walls. From the World of Ice and Fire, the Targaryen Kings. The conspiracy came to a head in 211 AC at the wedding tourney at White Walls, the great seat that Lord Butterwell had raised near the God's Eye. This was the same Butterwell who had once been Daron's hand until the king had dismissed him in favor of Lord Hayford because of his suspicious failure to act successfully against Damon Blackfire in the early days of his rebellion. At White Walls, under pretense of celebrating Lord Butterwell's marriage and competing in the tournament, many lords and knights had gathered, all of whom shared a desire to place a Blackfire on the throne. At last, the Blackfires made another attempt at the throne. At last, they were ready. At last, they had a plan. But it was a crappy plan, for many, <laughs> many reasons. So, as much as we can suggest that Damon II's shortcomings were part of the problem facing the Second Rebellion, a lot of the potential rebels may have stayed home because they just thought the plan was bad. They turned out to be wise, like Bittersteel, who again was not there. And didn't Gor Lord Gorman see how much that would be a problem for Damon II? From the Mystery Knight. Beggar's feast you've laid before us without Bittersteel. Bittersteel be buggered insisted a familiar voice. No bastard can be trusted, not even him. A few victories will bring him over the water fast enough. Lord Gorman is simultaneously downplaying the need for bitter steel, while also suggesting that he'll show up eventually. He's kind of saying, we do actually need him, but not right away. They intended to cause a spark, then a fire, with more joining their cause as the flames of their rebellion spread. Even if bitter steel didn't come right away, surely if this happened, he would. Once we have Butterwell's gold and the swords of House Frey, Harrenhal will follow, then the Brackens. That's from the Mystery Knight. And that was terribly optimistic. <laughs> to make it worse, not only did he and Damon II lack bitter steel, they lacked Valyrian steel. That's right. Damon II should have owned Blackfire by rights. It had been his father's after all. What could be more obvious? So here's perhaps the best proof that bitter steel was in charge. Damon II crossed without the family sword. You know, that may have been a pretty interesting conversation, or an ongoing conversation. Damon may have had some interesting arguments with Uncle Agor, period. Now here's where Bittersteel feels a bit like Randall Tarley, telling Sam to his face that he's not worthy of the family blade. And, also like Sam, part of this reason may have been his brother. Just as Sam was deemed unworthy next to Dickon, Bittersteel may have greatly preferred Damon's younger brother, Hagon, who would, indeed, wield Blackfire later. But we're not there yet. <laughs> it's also possible Bittersteel may have actually been fine with Damon II in general, despite the dreams, despite the other stuff. Perhaps it was just Lord Gorman's plan he hated. <laughs> Which I could see, because, man, it was a terrible plan. <laughs> Whatever Bittersteel's reasoning regarding Blackfire was when Damon II did arrive in Westeros, the bottom line was that he didn't have the sword, and that surprised many. Here's Black Tom Heddle again, and he's expressing doubt to Lord Gorman Peak. From the Mystery Knight. Old Milpo had expected the boy to have it, and so will all the rest. Glib words and charm cannot make up for that. A dragon would. The prince insists the egg will hatch. He dreamed it just as he once dreamed his brother's dead. A living dragon will win us all the swords that we would want. This quote tells us a lot. There's the revelation that bitter steel controls the sword, which may not have been a surprise to the rebels. The surprise was that Damon II didn't have it. Black Tom points out that the lack of the sword is a big problem. The other rebels will expect it, and their morale may drop considerably, or altogether. But Lord Gorman just isn't hearing it. He thinks a hatched egg will make up for Blackfire, and Damon II winning the tourney will be sufficient to convince other prospective rebels that Damon II is his father's son. 
Yeah, it's clear that Lord Gorman is relying really heavily on Damon the Second's dreams. He really expected that egg to hatch, it seems, or at least thought it was very, very likely. Damon the Second himself didn't seem to have any doubts at all. This is the same kind of optimistic interpretive error that Melisandre makes repeatedly again. Yeah, it's seeing what they want to see, that mm -hmm. whole thing. They were right that so many of the conditions in Westeros favored rebellion, but they were also glaring holes in their plan, and they filled them with dreams. <laughs> Holes can't be filled with dreams. <laughs> imagine if the egg really did hatch. Just imagine if the dream was accurate. It would be impressive, and no doubt that would win them some support. But not if it dies, and it surely wouldn't be much use in a fight for a long time, as we've learned quite well through Danny's point of view. Well, the rebels wound up hatching, hatchlingless and surrounded by a loyalist army, and since this was a tourney, none of the gathered lords had very many men with them. From the Mystery Knight. The first Blackfire Rebellion had perished on the red grass field in blood and glory. The second Blackfire Rebellion ended with a whimper. They cannot cow us! Young Daron proclaimed from the castle battlements after he had seen the ring of iron that encircled them. For our cause is just! We shall slash through them and ride hellbent for King's Landing! Sound the trumpets! Instead, knights and lords and men-at-arms muttered quietly to one another, and a few began to slink away, making for the stables or a postern gate or some hidey hole they hoped might keep them safe. And when Damon drew his sword and raised it above his head, every man of them could see it was not Blackfire. We'll make another redgrass field today, the pretender promised. Piss on that, fiddle boy! A grizzled squire shouted back at him, I'd sooner live. Most did, even some of those caught for the second time, but not Lord Gorman. As bad as it went, and as predictable as the failure was, really, it's no surprise that Bittersteel and company didn't get involved. But they would suffer nonetheless from this failure. Stains of the Brown Dragon. <laughs> the Brown Dragon, someone shouted. Laughter rippled through the yard as the dawn washed over White Walls. The men Peak and Damon II were counting on as staunch allies wound up laughing. <laughs> That's a far cry from what Damon II's father inspired from his followers. In fact, it's pretty much the opposite. Surely the laughter spread. The whole realm would learn of this joke. It is still special, though, from a meta perspective. The second Blackfire Rebellion stands out as the only one we see firsthand in the Mystery Night, of course. Not exactly what you think of when you hear the word rebellion, though, huh? <laughs> it was rather an aborted attempt at such that ultimately wound up in the mud. Literally. It was a miserable failure without a single loyalist slain. Wait, there was that guy that bragged about spying for Bloodraven, and that earned him a slit throat from a knight of House Costain. So one loyalist was slain? This one kill was around 15 years after the Redgrass Field, which is not exactly making progress. Yeah, at that rate, they'll... yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Here's what Bittersteel was now faced with. 15 years to prepare, and this was the best that they could do. It reflects terribly on their cause. And he knew it would fail, but he might not have expected Damon II to live. This became a huge problem, as Bloodraven himself tells us... From the Mystery Knight, Damon has four younger brothers and sisters as well. Should I be so foolish as to remove his pretty head, his mother will mourn, his friends will curse me for a kinslayer, and Bittersteel will crown his brother Hagon. Dead, young Damon is a hero. Alive, he is an obstacle in my half-brother's path. He can hardly make a third Blackfire King whilst a second remains so inconveniently alive. A better hostage than any of the ones the crown lost to the Great Spring Sickness. Of course, they didn't stop there. The ranks of the rebel hostages were fully replenished. Furthermore, one of the major sources of Westerosi support, House Peak, had a change of leadership. Lord Gorman lost his head, and despite his terrible plan, he was a valuable ally. Other lords who might have joined the Black Dragon would not be slow to take the lesson of this man's fall. All in all, it was a huge setback. That yeah, Bittersteel must have been really pissed. Very much so. Gotta yeah. agree. Yeah. So, this is the end of our episode now, so what then? Did Bittersteel just give up and pack it in? Was this the final straw? If you even entertain the idea of saying yes, I suggest you restart this episode from the beginning. Despite those losses, they still had Blackfire, four more sons of Damon, and a large group of exiled lords. None of that had been lost or even risked. Yeah, there was indeed a third and fourth Blackfire Rebellion, and then the War of Nine Penny Kings, and there's possibly still Blackfire blood in A Song of Ice and Fire, whether in Aegon VI, Illyrio, Sarah, Varys. Mmm, that's... Still yet to come, those ideas. This episode is winding down, but our coverage of Bittersteel is not. The next episode will center around his next great move, the Golden Company, 
and plans made by him, not foolish dreamers. I pointed at myself when I said him. <laughs> <laughs> and more on Agor himself. At this point, he's only about 39 to 40, and he lived at age 69. So there is plenty more to this story, which is great, because damn, if he just isn't a really cool character, and we love telling the story. Yeah. We don't just love him because he's a perpetual underdog. He's also another example of the richness of the setting, of Martin's ability to make the history Do of not prate at me of history, sir. Damon Blackfire was a rebel and usurper. Better steal a bastard. When he fled, he swore he would return to place a son of Damon's upon the Iron Throne. He never did. Words are wind, and the wind that blows exiles across the narrow sea seldom blows them back. Okay, okay. Sorry, Stannis. We hear you. We hear you. But you're wrong. He did return, and the idea of a Blackfire king sitting on the Iron Throne? Oh, well, that's a big part of why this story is so important. A lot of people to thank for this episode, starting with Rhaenys Targaryen, Stephen Atwell, Nina Friel... And of course, Sean Pink for helping out with the voices. That's Sean of House Beards, who some of you know from our Game of Thrones show-only reviews. Big thanks to Michael Klarfeld for the animations and sigils and lots of other visual goodies that you see, including the visual intro. Thanks to Ed Shear, a.k.a. The Art of Geekishness. Thanks to No Diggity, a.k.a. Mike Halstein. Our video editor is Ashea. Our audio editor is Yoke Boy. Our bards are Joey Townsend and Jesse Kowal. And of course, thanks to our Patreon supporters, including, but not limited to, our new Hand of the King, who remains in the shadows. For now, he will be called only Lord B.R. Thanks also to Lord Jim the Fortuitous of Wars and Politics of Ice and Fire and Warden of the West. Lord George Stormsville the Cunning is Lord of the Chiliad and Warden of the East. Cabeth the Unfrozen is Lord of the Bricks and Castle Crimson Light and new Warden of the North. Lady Kelly McMath of Covington is Lady of the Villa Hills and Crescent Springs and Warden of the South. Our King Beyond the Wall is Roanick Cantrell, wielder of the Valyrian Spoon. Roanick took heavy losses against the Hornfoot clan, but emerged victorious and undaunted. The Small Council is made up of Lord James Inkblade, the Scholar Knight and Master of Whisperers. Grand Maester Saria of the Barrows is Cinder of the Citadel. Lord Robert Jacobs is Master of Coin. Rosie the Clever is Master of Laws. Lord James Tuttle is Master of Ships. And a shout out to Dolgen, Maester of Lands. Lady Dyerliz of Castle Naki is the Alpha Patron. Lord Dan of the Red Mountains and Castle Great Bell is Breaker of the Second Stone. Lord Skip of the Velt is Lord of Castle Ganges. Mary Meg is Lady of the Bloody Stepstones. Gregor of the Toasty is Lord of the Breadfork. Alicia Everlasting of the Greenblood is Lady of Desert Rose. Jeffrey the Unflinching is Lord of Sand Lake. Lord Greybay is King of the Queen City. Lord Ryan of Castle Stonegate is Guardian of the Rocky Mountain Pass. Lord Garen de Havilland is of Devil's Hand Keep. Lord Brandon Slate is the North Hammer and Harbinger of the Old Gods. Ashlyn Winter is the Hawk's Eye and Lady of Castle Skyfall. Lady Mikkel of Moonacre is leader of the Werewood Protectorate Alliance. Lady Cachon Volant is at Swine Harbor. Lord Barone of Hillcrest is Lord of the Halls and wielder of the Valyrian Steel Machete Everblazed. Lord Alistair Whitaker is Lord of the Dawnhold. Lord Bemmy Snugglebunny of the Wolfswood is holder of the Vorpal Snugglebunny. And Lord Grayson Aurelius is the Crimson Angel, Lord of Hell's Caliber. Also, King's Justice Sir Troy the Steady is wielder of the Valyrian Steel Blade Fate. Our King's Guard is commanded by Lord Commander Dubbington, the Red Bear. The History of Westeros Night's Watch is led by Lord Commander George the Golden, First Ranger Fabian Flowers, the Bastard of Greenshield, First Builder Lyanna Kelly, the Lady of Steelhold, and First Builder Patchface of Motley Wisdom. And thanks to everyone for listening and sharing the show with your friends. We'll be back again soon with another episode. Until then, Valar Morgulls. <laughs>